Welcome to the Glassing Hour, a hunting and outdoors photography podcast. I'm your host, Ben Page, and each week I'm going to be sitting down with some of the best photographers, and we're going to be dissecting their style, their equipment, techniques, and their work. But most importantly, we're going to hear their stories. All right. Well, today on the show, we've got Ted Wells. Um, Ted, where are you you from? I live in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. Uh, Now, are you, have you always been from, uh, were you always in Bozeman? Uh, Nope. Uh, I was born in Montana. Uh, Grew up here through my early childhood, probably, well, until I was 12. And then I moved to central North Dakota, Jamestown cool little town uh and kind of started my waterfowling career there um right when i turned 13 and then right before my senior year of high school i moved back to montana and been here ever since what what's the deal with bozeman i feel like every other um outdoors company is headquartered there yeah bozeman is a it's an interesting place. It's, uh, you know, it's known by a lot of different terms. There's Brosman, Bos Angeles. Uh, gosh, I'm sure there's 50 different anyways. Um, man, I ended up here, honestly, it's just su- such a great place to raise your kids. And, you know, it's, you can do anything you can dream of outdoors within pretty close proximity to town. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I came over here from Billings where I, in my previous job, pre full-time photographer, um, and <clears throat> Billings is kind of the hub, the Metro hub of Montana. And, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't really a place where I wanted to start my oldest in school system. So we decided to pull the plug on the big city and get over here into the little less big city. And, uh, yeah, it's been great. Well, yeah, how big a town is it? Oh gosh, I think it grows like by 500 people a day it seems like, but I think there's 40 40ish thousand now, 43,000 people. Yeah, yeah, and there's just a is there a pretty high concentration of um outdoor companies or is that just the perception? Oh, uh, there is. This is a it's a big hub for you know, there's a few different kind of industries that people shoot for Bozeman. It's a huge tech hub as far as software programming, stuff like that. Um, outdoors are huge, obviously. Um, and then there's, I mean, obviously you got any kind of startup you could dream of. There's so many, you know, military guys getting out, starting startup businesses with photography gear and breweries and, I mean, you name it. I mean, there it's crazy. That's it. Almost you, you kind of make it painted a little bit like, uh, uh, like Boulder, almost um, of it the is. Boulder it's of very, Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's the Fort Collins slash Boulder type vibe. I think. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. Yep. So now you mentioned briefly a little bit your pre full photography uh, career. Um, uh-huh. What what did you do before? Uh, well, I've I uh, have a master's degree in sports medicine actually, and I ran a college sports medicine athletic training team. Um, you know, for the athletes and doing injury injury prevention, rehab, going in on surgeries, helping doctors, doing all the Med- medical stuff um and that was great you know i played sports my entire life played college ball and uh kind of transitioned into the sports medicine side after college ball just because i wanted to kind of still be around the team aspect of it and that led into you know more school and a master's degree and really a hell of a job right out of school and you know i about four years into that job. I did that for seven, almost seven years after school. And, uh, you know, I started kind of shooting the photos on the side and documenting hunts with my buddies and trying to 
you know, do the things I wanted to do with that. And it kind of started to lead to opportunities and conversations. And, you know, I decided finally, this has been almost three years now, two and a half, three years now that I've been full time at it. And, uh, yeah, I pulled the plug on the last job and it's been a hell of a ride so far and it's crazy, but it's been great. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, how, how old were you when you first, you know, picked up, uh, a camera? Uh, I was probably 26, 25, 26. Yeah. And what, what sparked that? Um, well, really, you know, the Sitka brands sparked it for me following, you know, guys like in the waterfowl space in particular was, that's kind of my thing. That's what I do. I don't, I don't big game hunt per se or chase things like that. I, you know, if there's waterfowl hunting to be had, that's, I'll be all over it. And, uh, you know, guys like Matt McCormick really pioneered the <clears throat> kind of Sitka type revolution of creative content in the industry and he's been gosh that was at least six years ago i'd say and i've been pretty involved with the brand since then since then kind of testing products and things meeting uh jim sobiers the uh product designer for waterfowl and uh you know got a lot of friends there in, that are you know in the brand and it's been great but i would say you know seeing uh matt initially taking so many badass photos of hunts and things and you know he was that's when i was in billings so we're pretty local we're pretty close to each other and you know we'd hunted together a few times and that's kind of really what kind of got me like man you know i think i can do that too and you know i got a little different eye everybody's got a little different eye for it and it's like how can i how can i stoke the brand and how can i move the needle and and that's kind of where it started yeah so uh, you're kind of affiliated with Sitka. Uh, are you, you, you know, do a lot of work with them. Uh, what other companies do you kind of work with? Um, you know, as a freelancer, you kind of take the work as you can get it, but you know, there's a lot of products that I've used and brands I've been passionate about long before ever caring to make a dollar from them or, you know, really being, being involved, but you know, it's all the kind of standard stuff for the for the bozeman crowd it's the sitka and the yeti and the you know it's the whole waterfowl kind of deal yeah how many and, uh, uh how many sitka vests and jackets do you see when you walk downtown bozeman oh god it, is it, is it more off Pat not it's that <laughs> or patagonia or marmot <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> nice you right know, tripping over yeti mugs be, and yeah the better question would be, and this is hilarious, the amount of kids walking out of an elementary school with Sitka jackets on would blow your mind. I that's unfathomable. <laughs> I mean, there there are Yeti water bottles in the Lost and Found that are unclaimed. <laughs> wow, it's nuts. Yeah, you don't leave those around where I'm from. So. Well, they wouldn't stay around. You know, somebody would yeah. claim them, right? <laughs> exactly exactly right. right so how would you how would you describe um your your style um you know it's interesting it's hard to describe it to talk about how i shoot something um you know everybody tries to be off, as authentic as possible and you know capture what happens in the moment and that's certainly something I strive to do. And, and then there's the art side of it that, you know, you can create an image that tells a story that may not have certainly happened at a period of time. Um, I don't do hardly any of that because I frankly haven't gotten into it, but you know, guys like Lee Chose or, I mean, that dude is, he's an artist. He'll shoot, you know, 20 or 30 different photos just, you know, on purpose, just to put together for one image. And to me, that's fascinating. Um, but I would say I'm pretty much a straight up shoot it as it happens type guy and, you know, edit it how the mood fits. And that's kind of how I do it right now. Yeah. Um, do you, would you say you do like 
a lot of post editing or do you kind of just keep it? No, um, not a whole lot. No, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. I, you know, I try and shoot it as good as I possibly can in camera. And then, you know, there's obviously a few things you can do to make it look nice and pretty afterwards, as far as obviously cropping is one main thing, but you know, I do a little clarity and little shadows and whatever it needs, but I try and do whatever I, you know, whatever I can in camera for sure. Right. Right. I'm still learning how to do that. And I feel, I feel like, uh, I'm, you know, very amateur photographer, um, in case we didn't already know that. <laughs> um, but I feel, I feel like I am too. <laughs> oh, oh, great. What does that say about me? <laughs> Always um, learning. Always learning. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you seen, um, or felt your style kind of change since you picked it up? Um, not so much the style. I feel like I've progressed a lot, obviously. And, and, uh, maybe paid attention more, you know, when, you know, when it's kind of your job, you probably pay attention more. You know, when I first started, I just kind of shot from the hip and kind of just held the shutter button down and shot what I thought I wanted to shoot and whatever, you know, and ended up with a lot of really good stuff. And, you know, but now I would say I shoot with a hell of a lot more of a purpose. And, uh, I would say I've progressed a lot on post-processing and kind of created my own style as far as editing goes. And I think that's, you know, where photographers can set themselves apart and differentiate themselves is kind of their, the way they finish an image, I think is, tells a lot about who shot it. I think that's probably the biggest thing is developing kind of my own style of editing and post-processing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, what makes you pick up the camera? You know, like what really catches, uh, when you're not, when you're not doing a, you know, anything for hire, what really, mm -hmm. what's your favorite thing to, to shoot? Uh, I take a lot of photos of my kids. Um, they're going to have a hell of a library by the time they care to look at it, I think, uh, <laughs> which makes me pretty proud to be honest. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of, uh, try to donate as much time as I possibly can to, you know, I've shot most of the families in the neighborhood, I think now for kids and families and babies and, you know, weddings of friends and family. And I just like to help people relive moments and, uh, you know, do whatever I can to help, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say, but I love to shoot a camera and I'll shoot whatever the hell I, can i guess <laughs> yeah 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 so um what are some of your your most uh memorable shoots in the last uh let's just go year oh in the last year <clears throat> i have done a ton of work for a company called quack rack uh big in the waterfowl industry they make uh it's american-made product they make uh utv accessory attachments for hauling gear uh rear racks front racks and roof racks and all kinds of good stuff um yeah i'm waiting for the I, truck i'm waiting for the truck version so truck version is coming <laughs> okay it perfect. Is sweet <laughs> yes sir it is i've seen it it is coming um <laughs> so anyways garrett walker's the owner of that company great dude um so we did four trips together last hunting season and that really consumed me as far as traveling goes um so we did uh early texas teal down there with the lifetime decoys crew in el campo and then we did canada up north which was awesome and then we went back down south to arkansas and then we stopped on the way back in north texas on the same trip and then all of the crew came up and hunted with me up here in montana with some of my buddies and that was a kind of a good capper to the season and and man all those hunts were memorable in their own right you know for me to be able to go out and kind of experience different parts of the country but then to bring you know people from other from those parts of the country up here everybody seems like kind of wants to come to montana and hunt right like it's kind of a yeah. destination yeah. for a lot of people and and uh had a lot of good shoots, had a lot of slow days and caught a lot of great content and 
I mean, it was just a ton of fun. So I'd say that probably those trips stuck out the most to me. Yeah. Where all, where all else has photography taken you? Oh man, I've, uh, I've done the great salt Lake down there with the mountain ops boys. That was a fun, crazy fun day. Well, two day shoot there. That was good. Um, you know, I just got back from Maryland last Wednesday for, uh, I was actually modeling for Leechos, shooting Benelli's new 828U Sport over an under shotgun. So that was cool. Um, gosh, it just feels like it's all a blur, to be honest with you. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like it's like the season rolls around and then it's gone, and you're like, "Holy cow, where where'd the last four months go?" I always feel like three quarters of the way through waterfowl season, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, uh, like." I don't think this thing's going to end. You know what I mean? But then the the last week you're like, where is it all gone? You oh, know, it's crazy. It goes so fast. Yeah. <clears throat> we have such a long season here. We have a 107 day season here in Montana. So, you know, by the time you, you know, we don't even get to start until October 1st. And so by the time you take a couple trips pre Montana season, and then you get all your buddy hunts in here, and local content stuff and things you're doing around here. And then you take, you know, four five, six more trips in between. All of a sudden it's like February and you're like, what, (laughs) what just happened? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Crazy. Absolutely. So, uh, what, what kind of gear do you use? I'm a Nikon shooter. Um, primarily shoot the D five body. Um, that's kind of my go-to. I do have a D850 as well, which I really like. Um, if I'm shooting big print type material, I'll shoot the 850 just because it produces massive files. Um, <clears throat> and then, then I have a big slew of lenses, but I would say that I would primarily shoot like a super wide. If I was going to pick two lenses and two bodies for a hunt, obviously I'd have a couple D5s or a D5 and an 850 and a something super wide like a 14 to 24 28 and then a 70 to 200 28 it's about all you i would ever shoot on a hunt okay and so. you know how do you how do you go ahead and choose that kind of uh, the moment like it's obviously there's a little bit of a switch out there and when you're trying to mm-hmm. be you know as candid as possible how do you go about sure. uh switching up gear like that um well it depends on the situation like you said but you know if i'm shooting like dogs or candids or, you know, people in the blinds, people shooting volleys, whatever it may be. I'll shoot the long lens just so I can be further away. And nobody really knows I'm there and taking photos. Um, you know, but I feel like there's a lot of use for that super wide. It's really unique, kind of that super distorted, goofy looking kind of photo. Um, low light, I'll shoot like a 50... Like I use a Sigma Art 50 1.4 and that's, uh, that 1.4 aperture is really nice when it's super dark. So I'll shoot like, sure. you know, the standard headlamp shots or, you know, it's super early kind of gray light. I'll kind of run that aperture way down and I can run the shutter way up and make everything real nice. And, um, but I would say those three lenses can pretty much accomplish anything in any situation, really. Um, and then you got specialized stuff like uh, I have a Nikon 200 F2, which is a kind hmm. of a giant. I mean, it's gigantic. It weighs like 10 pounds, um, but it's very unique. Um, it's kind of known as the ultimate portrait lens. Um, but, you know, when I'm shopping around and trying to figure out, you know, what kit to use and what how can I be different, that was my kind of thought with getting that 200 f2 is i know that you know other than about two different people that i know have them in the industry that nobody else is running around during a hunt with a lens like this and it creates some pretty unique stuff especially with dogs i mean shooting a shooting a retrieving dog with the 200 is pretty special yeah uh, what does it end up doing to it uh you know how would you explain Um, it's just, it's crazy sharp. And then that F2 aperture, granted, I never shoot it on F2 when it's, you know, like a dog or anything, cause it's too shallow, 
but just the quality of the build and the quality of the glass in a lens like that is, it's just so sharp and crazy high quality, you know, as far as your end image goes. And then your background blur is, is super creamy. It looks real nice. Right. Right. Compared to, compared to like a 70 to 200, even, I mean, that's really nice too, but it's, it's a, it's a difference for sure. When you look at the two images together. When I think of um, your photography, there was a picture of a guy in a kayak, I think, um, uh-huh. that I, the way that you're describing, uh, you know, how that lens uh, works kind of fits the bill. Um, yep. Gosh, I can't. Do you, do you perhaps know the, he's facing you. Um, I think there was like a, it was a red kayak. I can't remember. Gosh, I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah. On, on Instagram? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think it was, oh, it was yes. a while ago. I believe that that was my brother-in-law fishing, I think. Does that yeah. strike a chord? Yeah. 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 That yeah. yeah. The, yep. That was with the 200. Okay. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> yeah. And that background just is gone. There's nothing to even look at other than the subject, right? Like that's right. Yep. The, and he's that's what super, it it's like, you. it's almost like hyper real. <clears throat> yep. Uh, yep. Yep. Exactly. That's a pretty cool look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say. Would you say like that hyper real kind of thing? That's if we're if we're seeing that from you, it's it's you're using that lens. Yeah, I would say anything that the subject is just drastic, and there's mm-hmm. really nothing else to look at. That's probably that lens. Yep. Yeah, For that's sure. pretty cool. Yep. Yep. Okay, what non, um, not a lens, not a camera. What other essential gear is there for you in your kit bag? Oh man. <clears throat> Great question. Um, I would say a ton of Zeiss wipes, a rocket blower for when, you know, the moisture starts happening. Um, <clears throat> a really good like peak design sling where you can hold that thing. Um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, Pelican case for your memory cards is important. Mm. Uh, a good drive where you can dump all your stuff when you're on the road. Um, I don't pack a laptop ever when I travel. I oh, just really? dump remotely onto a drive if I need to. Um, so, I mean, if you're a laptop guy and you want to edit on the road, I never edit on the road. I always wait till I get home because I feel like it. I kind of get in a different mind space and can sit down and focus. Um, but gosh, as far as that, my, I mean, if you open my Pelican case right now, it's pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot of gadgets and gizmos in there other than a couple bodies, handful of lenses and a bunch of cleaning stuff <laughs> and a, you know, card holder. So the Pelican case kind of prompted this thought in my head. How do mm-hmm. you, uh, how do you fly with your cameras? Uh, well, I never check anything that's that it, that I care about, frankly. Um, so, you know, I'll put all the necessities that I may need for a shoot, clothing-wise, waiters, sit, you know, gear, whatever. In like, uh, I I check like a Yeti Panga bag is what I check most of the time, just because it's pretty bomb-proof. Yeah. Um, and then I always uh, carry a backpack with you know your you know change of skivvies if you if your bag gets lost in a couple, you know, a little change of clothes. And then, um, I just wheel my Pelican 1510 and I put the 200, it has its own case. It's too big to fit in the Pelican. I just kind of strap it over the top and that's my quote unquote purse. That's my, that's your personal, your personal (laughs) item. Yeah. That's my personal item. And, uh, (laughs) yeah, you know, I've, I've flown a lot of times and I've had, I've had one, one problem ever with that lens and it was in bozeman believe it or not some gal had a really shitty morning from united and told me that i couldn't bring that lens and i had to try and fit it in my check bag and i had to check it and i said there is no way i'm gonna put a seven thousand dollar lens underneath your plane no way i'm not doing it and she says well sir you're gonna have to try and fit it in your backpack you know, like, how, how am I supposed to fit this in my backpack? How long is it? 
Uh, well, the hood on it's huge. I would say if you take the hood off, it's not. They call it the the chubby. So if you if you get on the Google machines and Google the Nikon chubby, it'll come up the two hundred f two. There's actually a Facebook owners group for this lens. Believe oh, wow. it or not, it's it creeps me out. I'm not a part of it for the record. But anyways, oh, <laughs> it's uh it's really short and it's really fat. I would say it's only, gosh. 10 inches long, 12 inches long, maybe. But by the, t- when you put the hood on, then it's hood probably, it. it's probably 14 or 16 inches long, but it's got a 160 millimeter objective, I think, or 140 millimeter. It's huge. Oh man. So like when uh, you look into the it... lens, you can't see the camera. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <crazy. laughs> so how'd that story resolve itself? Well, it finally, uh, you know, I, it was, five o'clock in the morning and I'm over it. I'm, I would think it was when I was flying to Arkansas for quack rack. And you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like lady, I, I'm not doing this. I said, I've flown a hundred times with this thing and I've never, ever had an issue. And finally her manager come over and I was getting pretty annoyed at this point. Like my plane was boarding and I, you know, when you fly out of Bozeman, you show up 15 minutes before your plane boards and it's never a problem. And right, right. finally, your manager came over and just said, just go. And I said, thank you, sir. And I left and it was fine. <laughs> so, oh, man. Well, yeah, that'd be pretty nerve wracking. It is, you know, and it's just people don't understand that's your livelihood and you're not going to put put it under the plane because what's going to happen, you know, you're not going to get anything out of it if something happens to it. it right? Yeah. Like th- they don't no. insure your stuff for that. So, yeah, exactly. Anyway, exactly. Now, do you carry uh, insurance for your equipment? I do, yeah. And actually, I uh, I learned a very interesting thing in the insurance. So any photographers that have a lot of gear, listen up. So if you are a renter or a homeowner, and this goes for most insurance companies. So I use Safeco, for, ex- for example. Um, I learned not that long ago, and I thought I was covered, but if somebody broke into my house right now and stole all my camera gear, I'm only insured to $2,500 because I didn't have, ev- I don't have every single piece of my gear scheduled as a separate entity. Mm. And the guy, so when, when I talked to the agent about this, he said, you would be surprised that nobody schedules their stuff. Nobody. They just learn it the hard way. Just, you mean like itemize? Yeah, it has to be each individual item over a certain value has to be scheduled separate. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, okay, so I have $30,000 plus worth of stuff. If somebody wanted to walk into my house, you're trying to tell me I'm going to get a $2,500 check to replace it all? And he's like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm going, well, we need to figure this out because that's not going <laughs> to work for me. <laughs> you know? No. So, so I would, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say, if you're listening, look into that and make sure you're covered because that would be a really tough lesson to learn. You know? Yeah. That, that is a pro tip right there for you. That is very interesting. And and I'm very thankful. I did not have to learn that the hard way. Oh, what lessons have you learned the hard way? Oh gosh, a lot, probably too many to list. I would say the best thing as far as being successful in the industry. See, there's three rules of life that I follow. Rule number one, is don't be a dumbass. Rule number two is humble and modest. And rule number three is over deliver. And if you do all three of those things in conjunction or separately, you really can't fail. Hmm. So I try and live by those things and it's never failed me. Granted, I've had, you know, I've done some things that have taught me those things, but that's okay. Right, right. Um, but it's, you know, gotten me where I'm at right now. And I'm thankful for that for sure. Um, so I would say those three rules of life will never steer you wrong. Yeah. Those are pretty good rules. Pretty good little mantra. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> all right. The, the, the formal lesson portion, I guess. Um, how would you explain, you know, we've been talking a little bit about uh, the chubby. Uh, yep, yep. How do you, how do you explain to a, like pretty much, um, beginner almost the function of and description of lenses um you know that's kind of a and i'm not a great 
speaker when it comes to something like that. I feel like I just kind of go with it as I learn. But, um, you know, firstly, get what you can afford. I mean, obviously, everybody's in a different stage and everybody's, you know, in a different kind of avenue as far as that goes. Um, but I would say buy the most expensive glass you can, you know, the highest quality glass you can afford first because you're always going to want to buy it later. Um, I mean, the, like the Sigma art line is fantastic for the money as far as that low aperture, like the F 1.4s and one, they make a 1.8 for the crop that 18 to 35, 1.8. If you're shooting like anything crop, you know, the Canon 60, 70, 80 D and the 7,000 series Nikons or, you know, wherever you're at in the crop, that Sigma art is like 650 bucks and it's crazy sharp, crazy high quality. Um, but I would just say start with the highest end glass you can possibly afford in like that 50 millimeter range, 35 millimeter range and shoot with it and get comfortable and figure out where it's winning for you and where you need more as far as maybe even focal length, as simple as focal length and uh, just evolve from there. Now, did you ever take any uh, formal education or, you know, online courses or um, was it all, you know, how, how did you come by your knowledge? Um, nothing formal. Um, done a lot of tutorial watching type stuff. A lot of just trial and error on my own. You know, as far as like lighting something, you know, in the garage playing with how aperture and shutter speed and ISO and everything affect the image. Um, you know, I constantly, where I'm at now, I, I really love to sit down and watch, you know, all different types of tutorials from landscape guys or, you know, guys that shoot stars or whatever it may be and try to figure out if there's something that I'm missing that I can apply to what I do. Um, so I would say at least three, four times a week, I sit down, you know, when the kids go to bed and just watch something and see if I can't pick something up, but, uh, mostly all self-taught. Obviously, a lot of help from friends and mentors, and and uh, you know I've tried to return the favor to younger or newer shooters as many times as I you know as much as I possibly can, and and uh, you know I won't ever stop doing that. I enjoy doing that, but yeah, mostly all self taught. How did you shoot? There's a picture. It's I think it's from your boat or your something. I think you're hauling something, and the the boat is super sharp, and the truck is super sharp. And the lens is super sharp. How did you get it, like, keep it from knocking around? Like, how'd that shot get uh, set up? Well, I'm sitting in the back of the boat. Uh, <laughs> truck and trailer are going 55 miles an hour down the, the uh, highway, and I'm sitting in the back of it. Uh, but that's a uh, slow shutter. So you uh, your settings for something like that generally would be like a 125th of a second shutter and a real low ISO, like a 100 or 200. And then you got to stop your aperture way, way down, like a F18 to 22, just so you're, you know, you can get enough light and your image will turn out. Um, but, you know, with those settings, you can pretty much shoot anything moving, like those show slow shutter motion blurs. Um, and then your continuous focus, and you just kind of hold the focus point right where you want it to be. And honestly, you just hammer the shutter and then pick one that's, that turns out it's a, it's a cat and mouse game. It's not just one photo, you know, it's a, yeah, you hammer on it and you get home and you're like, man, I hope one of those turned out. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, the continue, the continuous, continual focus. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess talk to me a little bit about that function. I don't, I don't think I have explored that on my body. Yeah. So on Nikon, it's autofocus continuous or AFC and on uh Canon it's, AI servo. Um, so basically, you know, you'll have that little square focus point inside your viewfinder. And as long as you're holding focus, either I'm a back button focus guy. So that AF on button, that would be like mm -hmm. where your right thumb is on the back of your camera. Yep. Um, I've I seen my, it. I don't. Yep. So you have to go into your menu and switch your camera to activate that button for focus, which I would recommend. Um, and then that frees up your shutter button to be a shutter only. 
And so you're not ha- half pressing that shutter, trying to get it to focus and then clicking it all the way down. I th- you know, I feel like that's counterproductive a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I shoot an a- uh, AFC shit pretty much all the time. Um, and I've, you know, just hold down that back button and then my shutter's free for shutter only. And so as, as long as I'm holding that AF on button, my camera's constantly look, looking for focus, wherever that focus point is in my viewfinder. And then you find sense? it. Yeah. And then you find it and then. <clears throat> yep. So, and you know, a lot of times you're just holding that AF on button and the shutter at the same time. And then that camera will figure it out. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Well, hey, there you go. That's good. I shoot a, uh, I have a Nikon D3000 right now that I'm oh, learning yeah. on. So. Yep. I started on a 5200. I I thought $250 was a lot for a camera. Uh, well, when I was yeah, like, oh man. It, it can be. <laughs> Depends where you're at. It can be. And that's, that's a great true. camera to get going on for sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You can learn everything you need to learn on that for sure. And so what's up with the, uh, all the German shepherds? Uh, so those are, uh, that's a probably my most favorite thing to do. The local company here, they're actually, the owners of the company live about six houses away from me. Um, and I kind of met them, you know, we moved in and I had seen, uh, the owner, one of the owners, Kim, it's a husband and wife that are, um, veterans kind of high-end military veterans that started this uh protection dog company and they lived in kenya at the time that's when they, that's where they started it um but anyways they you know got out of the of the service and and ended up in jackson hole first and continued the business and then ended up in bozeman and so when i first moved into this neighborhood i had always noticed uh kim drives a suburban and it's the full vehicle wrap that's logo. It's fallen. And I'm going, God, I wonder what that is. You know, and I'm kind of thinking to myself and I had done some research on it, you know, finally. And I'm like, man, that is so cool. You know, and it's just fascinating. Like dogs of all kinds fascinate me. That's one of my, that's probably my favorite thing to photograph is dogs doing what dogs do. Right. Like I love it. And, uh, you know, I had done some research and, and, uh, finally just ran into, um, Kim and met her on a whim just in the neighborhood here. And, and had met her husband, Jeff, and he's a ultimate badass, like crazy cool guy. And, uh, anyways, we ended up having a garage beer and talking about content and social media and, and things. And he, you know, he kind of brought it up. He goes, well, we just fired our social media guy. And I'm like, really? (laughs) And they, uh, yeah, it ended up the next day, another garage beer meeting. And I got hired as the content and the social media guy. And it's been, gosh, almost over two years now that I've been doing that. And, they're just incredible dogs and in their uh they're actually Belgian Malinois for the for the most part. Um and then those darker brindle ones are a Dutch shepherd that kind of get the Dutch shepherd strain from the breeding. There's not very yep. many of those, but for the most part they're Belgian Malinois and they are the most incredible athletes and I mean they're like humans as far as as brains go and they take all their commands in Dutch, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so yeah, they're just super highly capable and they're the sweetest family dogs you've ever, I mean, they're, they're incredible. Crazy. I can't even explain it. Any, any good at retrieving ducks? I haven't tried, but I, you know, I asked him about it and she, she said no. (laughs) (laughs) Gotcha. Gotcha. She she wasn't on board for that. But anyway. No, no. No. How do you, how do you, uh, what tips do you have for? taking photos of black labs. Ah, uh, interesting. <clears throat> um, obviously the light's got to be right for black labs. Anything with direct sunlight or real bright midday light is going to be terrible. I would say cloudier day, the better. And then, you know, if you get to be too dark where, you know, it's, it's washed out or you're not able to grab focus, I would say using the exposure compensation on your camera helps a lot to bring out the shadows. Um, but I've always had the best luck in, in, if it's sunny, either in water, which helps if you have sun going into the dog's eyes or anytime that it's a cloudy day, I would say that's the best time to shoot black labs. How do you go about setting up for catching birds in flight? What's kind of, um, fastest shutter possible. Um, you know, my cameras run at eight, one, eight thousand of a second. So most of the time I'll. 
put it in manual mode, obviously, and run it to uh, like one four thousand, and then meter my ISO where it's going to expose correctly, and I'll shoot it at like if you're shooting like a seventy to two hundred two eight, I'd shoot it at like f five point six, just so you know if you get a nice close shot you know, everything will be in focus instead of just the eyeball and then the wings will be out of focus if you shoot it too shallow. So I would shoot it like 5.6, 6.3, somewhere in there, and then get to at least a 1600 shutter for sure. Unless you want to purposely show some motion blur in the wings, and then you can probably pull that off with like a 1800 shutter. Oh yeah, I end up doing that quite frequently, but not on purpose. Yeah, which I which I really like, honestly. I mean, I think it shows more of a story than just a completely frozen bird. What kind of editing software do you use actually? Uh Lightroom. And uh do you have do you set it up like presets? And I know you mentioned a little bit how you have you try to do it all in cam or a lot of it in camera just to save yourself uh-huh. is it to save yourself time on the back end or it just saves you a lot of time in editing and I've kind of developed a few of my own presets just through trial and error. And obviously I just have those saved in my own Lightroom and then you know if friends want to borrow them then I'll share them over. But you know I'll have like a bright sunny day type preset and then I'll have a cloudy day type deal and then one for the snow or you know, something like that, just where it gives me a real quick kind of baseline to start with. And then I'll always adjust from there. What can we be looking forward to, uh, uh with you coming up here? Oh, a lot more of the same, <clears throat> bunch more work for quack rack. I'm looking forward to, and a bunch more kids stuff and <laughs> just kind of life as we know it here so far, a lot of fishing this summer and we'll go from there. Now I, f- I feel like a lot of, um, well, maybe, maybe it's just me. Um, but it can't be possible that when you go out, you know, um, on these shoots and these hunts, it's not just like, it's not all fun and games Sure. and that there's moments where it's like, maybe things get frustrating. It's not just out hunting with the buddies and snapping mm-hmm. pictures. You want to kind of tell the, the story of, you know, like what that's, what it's like to be a, a hired lens. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly stressful at times and obviously good relationships with people you're photographing with can save you as far as your own headaches go. But, um, you know, I try and stay, I I don't want to say detached, but I, I would, I try to, I would say, try to stay out of the hunt as much as you can, because, you know, personally, I'm a hunter first. If you're going to put a gun and a camera in front of me. And a flock of mallards sure as hell going to grab the gun, right? Like that's what I want (laughs) to be doing. Um, But, you know, I think there's a lot of benefit in having a true hunter as a photographer also, you know, as far as in the waterfowl space, having a waterfowler as a photographer certainly helps. Um, But I would just say trying to remove yourself from not so much the moment. I wouldn't remove yourself from the moment because the moment's what you're getting, but you know, trying to take yourself out of the mind frame of hunting is so hard to explain. I don't even know what I'm saying, but try to not get so deep into the hunt where you're missing things, I guess. Right. The best right. Way to say that. You kind of have to stay through that, the photographer lens and you I, can't bite too hard on the hunt lens. Yeah. I would say watch, watch the hunt through your lens more than you watch it through your eyes. Hmm. So. Uh, can you, are there any memorable, uh, frustrating moments or, oh, craps, um, that you've had? Oh, tons. I mean, you always miss shots and you always wish you did this and wish you did that. And, you know, mostly it's just the weather, I would say frustrates me more than anything. As far as, you know, if you're on a, a shoot where it's just a specified shoot, you know, you're not necessarily hunting, but you're gathering content for a specific purpose. And then you get a, 75 degree bluebird sky day for you know most of the day so you're shooting for an hour and a half in the morning and you're shooting an hour and a half at night and that's the end of it i think it's probably the most frustrating part as far as you know big shoot type stuff goes <clears throat> um but yeah i mean as far as hunting stuff goes it, it hunting is hunting hunting's no different with a gun than it is with a camera you know it, there's always going to be the same struggles everybody else deals with you know and and I would say taking it as a hunter, 
rather than taking it as you're doing something wrong. I think it's probably important. Like it's not your fault. Um, I don't know. I try to take everything with a grain of salt stuff that's out of your control. So if you were to have only, uh, you only get to have one camera body for the, the rest of your life. Uh, just one. Mm-hmm. Um, D five. What do you, what do you D five? D five. Uh, for sure. Same thing. Same thing with a lens. 70 to 200 to eight. Have you been asked this question before? Yes. Or do you just know? <laughs> I gotcha. answer the same every single time. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. So I think I know the answer to this one already. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, it's it's a two it's a two part question. Okay. What's your favorite What's your favorite state? Montana. And what's your favorite state to hunt ducks in? Montana. Okay. All right. <laughs> what What is <laughs> what uh, What's a close What's a close second? Ooh, Canada. Is that a state? That yeah. doesn't count, does it? It's like North the Dakota. Big state I love North Dakota. Uh, North that's Dakota. that's part of Canada, right? Uh, it's basically it's South Canada. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I wish they just wall off Montana. To be honest with you. Oh yeah, no, no in, no yeah. out. No in, no out. Especially no in. Other than <laughs> special invite, invite only. Do you feel like that uh, it's becoming a little bit of a, a problem? Um, all the and I never would have pegged Bozeman or Montana for a software type of t- place. I guess. Yeah, it's quiet. I think that that's exactly why they're doing it. I think because people aren't pegging them for that. You know, um, have you seen any changes over the last couple of years with just the influx of people? Yeah. Everything's super expensive. I mean, it, real estate's ridiculous. I mean, I, I rent a townhouse for $2,100 a month. I mean, it's oh, not, man. it's nice, but like I rent, I can't afford to buy a house. It's nuts. So yeah, real that's... estate's crazy. Typical growing pains for a city. The economy's booming everything's booming everybody's making money but it's like not it's crazy yep. uh so i guess kind of the the final uh takeaway here is if you add only five minutes to uh you know bestow the most important knowledge or tips to uh, a would-be hunter what would you tell them to, to focus on a would-be hunter uh i would say focus on the people you're hunting with and not focus on what you're killing or how many things you're killing, I think would be number one. Um, and, you know, try and focus on, you know, conserving the future of everybody else. You know, I think more and more, or I guess less and less young people are getting into it. I don't know what their, you know, the fears are, but, you know, I've grown up my entire life hunting and, you know, some of my best friends in the world for my entire, you know, life I've met through hunting. And so I would, I mean, that, that's kind of a loaded question, but I would just say <laughs> focus more on the people you're experiencing it with and the experience itself rather than what you are hunting or how much you're killing. You know, you kind of knocked that one out of the park. I run like two podcasts. One's a hunting podcast. One's a photography podcast. And I meant, uh, I meant photography, but I said hunting sometimes. Oh, well, I forget which, enough. uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, for sure. So for a photographer, I would just say, get what you can get and shoot as much as you possibly can and enjoy it because I mean, it's fun, right? Like I'm not doing this cause it's not fun. Like this isn't work to me. I love it and I got into it because it was fun and I wanted to do something different and remember things. And I mean, that's what it's all about. It doesn't matter if you make any money at it. I think if you get into it with aspirations and dreams of making it, you know, a career, then I think it's, I don't want to say you'll be let down, but it's certainly takes some of the fun out of it, I would say. It yeah, sounds if you're, shitty, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it probably with anything when you're trying to feed your family with, uh, right. with something, it gets a little right. harder. Yeah, so. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's just different. I would say but. different. Yeah, for right. sure. Uh, Ted, do you have any uh, you any plugs you want, um, or anything that you want the, the to leave the listeners with? Uh, I'm not a big plug guy, but thanks for having me on. Yeah, man, enjoyed it. Awesome, awesome. Happy hunting tear it up yeah yeah well if you ever <laughs> find yourself in kansas uh let me know oh that's um, one place i've never hunted 
I need to go there. Oh yeah, it's it's not too bad. Oh, I, I know what it's all about. <laughs> I got some friends down there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah. <clears throat> you ever find your way down here? That kind of uh, that's a good lead off, I think. And then uh, hopefully maybe we'll have you on the the waterfowl podcast someday too. So yeah, let's do it. Well, hey, I appreciate it, and uh, look forward to. Um, I, Pretty much every time I open up my Instagram, you're one of the first ones that pops up for some reason or another. So, <laughs> well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, Ted, have a have a good one. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate you. Yep. Bye.